Hey folks, my name is Nathan Johnston. Welcome to lecture 12 of Introductory Linear Algebra. Today is all about block matrices, and the idea behind block matrices is oftentimes when you're working with large matrices, there's going to be patterns in the entries, and it's useful to be able to exploit those patterns to be able to do computations more quickly. Okay, so what I mean by this, to illustrate this a little bit more concretely, consider these two matrices here. Okay, so in this matrix A, for example, if I look at this top left 3x3 three three corner, that's a 3x3 three three identity matrix sitting up there, right? Like there's ugly junk, you know, elsewhere in the matrix, but this top left block, that's easy. I, I know about 3x3 three three identity matrices. They work very nicely with matrix multiplication, for example. Okay, and in the bottom left corner, well, that's just a zero matrix. Again, zero matrices are very nice. So I sort of want to be able to exploit the fact that part of this matrix looks like an identity and part of this matrix looks like a zero matrix and use those facts to make it easier to do computations with A. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to partition these matrices, okay? So I'm going to sort of group the entries together in some way. I'm going to sort of block off certain columns and certain rows. And that's why I'm indicating with these green dashed lines here. These green dashed lines, they don't really have any mathematical meaning. They're just sort of for my own mental bookkeeping of sort of where I'm imagining these matrices broken up, okay? So another way of writing these matrices then with this partitioning in mind is I could write down the matrices as... Well, the matrix A, for example, if I scroll back up, that matrix A in the top left corner, I've got a three by three identity matrix. So A has a three by three identity matrix at the top left. It has another three by three identity matrix at the top right. It's got a two by three zero matrix at the bottom left, and then it's got some other ugly junk at the bottom right. So I'll just call that matrix, whatever that two by three matrix is, it doesn't already have a pre-existing name. I'll just call it C, okay? And that's what's at the bottom right corner of A. Okay, and I can do a similar thing with that matrix B. B, I can write that as some matrix D, and then a zero matrix, and a zero matrix, and then that same matrix D, right? Because if I scroll back up to this matrix B, what's happening in the top left corner is I've got some junk. In the bottom right corner, I've got the exact same junk. And then I've got zeros up there and zeros down there, okay? So that's all I'm doing when I write B in this way. And then D is that sort of junk in the top left and junk in the bottom right. Okay, so in other words, I'm going to think of these large matrices as matrices whose entries are smaller matrices, okay? And it's okay to do that. It turns out that a really miraculous thing happens when you do this. Basically, everything just works how you would hope it would work. It turns out you can multiply block matrices together and everything works. You get the right answer when you do these sort of block matrix multiplications. Okay, so let's do an example here. Let's multiply A and B together, except I'm not going to do it the long way, right? If I do it the long way, then I've got to multiply, what is this? This is a 5 by 6 matrix by a 6 by 4 matrix. I don't want to do that, especially not by hand, okay? We could do it, but it would be really ugly and long. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these block matrix forms that I wrote down, and I'm going to multiply them together and see what happens. And it turns out I'm going to get the right answer. Right? So this is the block form that I wrote down for A, and this is the block form that I wrote down for B. Now let's just naively do matrix multiplication here. So another, what I mean by that is I'm going to do like sort of thinking of it as like a dot product of top row uh, with left column, and then top row with right column, and then bottom row with left column, and bottom row with right column. And when I do that, what do I get? Well, on the top left entry, I'm going to get I times D plus I times 0. In the top right corner, I'm going to get i times 0 plus i times d. Bottom left corner, I'm going to get 0 times d plus c times 0. In the bottom right corner, I'm going to get 0 times 0 plus c times d. Okay, now I just simplify each of these expressions. Whenever I've got i times something, eh, great, that's just the something, right? Multiplying by an identity matrix doesn't do anything. And whenever I've got something times 0, well, that's just 0, okay? So it goes away. So all these terms with zeros just go away. Okay, so after I simplify things as much as I can using my multiplication rules for identities and zero matrices, on the top I'm just left with a D and a D. On the bottom left I'm, I get a zero because it's zero plus zero, and in the bottom right I get C times D. Okay, I know what D is, I know what D is. I'm going to have to do a little side calculation to figure out what C times D is though, so let's do that. Okay, so I still have to do a little bit of work by hand, but it's a lot easier than doing the whole big ugly matrix multiplication, right? Because these matrices C and D are a lot smaller. Okay, and again, just to remind you, C and D, I'm just copying down from up here, right? This is the same C as here and the same D as there. So that's the matrix multiplication that I'm doing. So it's a 2 by 3 times a 3 by 2. So dot product of this with this 
then this with this, then this with this, and this with this, so right, rows with columns, and at the end of the day you get a 2 by 2 matrix, and it's 5, 4, minus 7, 1. All right, and the point is this matrix C times D, that's going to be this right bottom right corner here. And now I know all the pieces that I've got to plug in here, so just plug them all in, okay? A, B equals D, D, 0, C, D, and just plug in all those matrices. Here is what D is, here is what D is, here is what C, D is, and then I just throw zeros in to pad out the bottom left corner. Okay, and that's it. That's what A times D is. And if you really want to convince yourself that this is true, you can go back to the original matrices A and B and multiply them together the long way, and everything will work out. You'll get the exact same answer. Okay, and this is true in general. Block matrix multiplication, it just works. Okay, as long as sort of every step in the computation actually makes sense, as long as sizes of matrices work together in the proper way, okay? And to illustrate what I mean by this, there, there are lots of ways that block matrix multiplication go, can go wrong, all related to the sizes of the matrices and the blocks. So let's be a little bit careful. Let's go through a bunch of examples to see how things can go wrong so we know what to avoid, okay? So we know when not to sort of break things down into blocks. All right, so suppose we've got two matrices. Doesn't really matter what their entries are, but here's a two by two and there's a two by three, okay? And now, the question is, which of these block matrix multiplications actually makes sense? Okay, so when could you actually do these computations? So let's start off with ABBA all squared. When, I could, when could I take this matrix ABBA and actually multiply it by itself? Okay, now, there's a problem here, okay? And that problem is, here I've got a matrix A stacked up on top of a matrix B, but what does that actually mean in this case? Here A has two columns, B has three columns. So what does it mean to put A on top of B? Okay, alarm bells should be going off. Okay, does it mean something like this where I've got, okay, A in the top left corner and then B down here and then I've got B up there and then A down there and then I'm gonna square that whole thing? You can't do things like that, okay? It's not clear what you actually mean. So the problem here is the partitions don't line up, right? If I've ever got a matrix stacked on top of another one, they got the same number of columns. Similarly, if I have matrices side by side, they've got the same number of rows. That's okay here, they both have two rows, but you know, watch out for it. Okay, so we say the partitions, they have to line up, they have to be conformal. And that just means sort of the lines that you draw in the matrix to specify where you're doing your block partitioning. They all have to just be straight lines, all the way from the top to the bottom, all the way from the left to the right. Okay, no sort of jig jaggy lines like we've got in this one here, not allowed. Even if we did allow jig jaggy lines like that, this example has another problem, and that is it has four rows, five columns, and we can't we can't uh, take powers of something like that. If you're taking powers, it has to be a square matrix, remember? So that's another problem here. Okay, another thing that you've got to watch out for is illustrated by this second example here, okay? And that is your block matrices have to have proper sizes to be able to do matrix multiplication. The inner dimensions have to agree, just like with regular matrix multiplication. Okay, so in this example, we can't do it because we got a two by two times a three by two and those inner dimensions don't match. They're two and three, All right? So no, that matrix multiplication doesn't make sense either, okay? Because the block matrices have the wrong sizes. All right, well, what about this one? This seems to fix that problem. Here I've got a two by two block matrix times a two by two block matrix. I can do that, so let's multiply that out and what do I get? I get a squared, that's fine, a squared's a thing, I get zero, that's a thing, I get a, that's a thing, and then I get a squared plus ba. I mean, at first glance, it seems like everything's probably fine here, except, let's scroll back up, what are b and what are, what is it, like, what are b and a? Well, b is a two by three matrix and a is a two by two matrix. So here, when I write b times a, that means a two by three matrix times a two by two. And, oh shoot, that doesn't make sense, right? I can't do a two by three times a two by two because again, the inner dimensions don't match. And then I'd be adding a squared to it. So I'd be adding a two by two to that result. Uh, like, I, I mean, I just can't do this. The sizes don't match up. And actually I cheated a little bit even in the bottom right entry. Yeah, it's identity times a in the bottom right, except it's a three by three identity times a, which is two by two. You can't do a three by three times a two by two. It's not actually equal to a, it's equal to gibberish. Right? So neither of these entries on the right actually make any sense. So there's problems with that one as well. Finally, one last example. Can we do this one? Can we do AB0I3 times B0I3I3? I3? All right, and again, like two by two times two by two. So at first glance, it seems okay. Let's do the multiplication. Here I've got AB, that's fine. That's two by two times two by three, plus B, well, that's okay. This is a two by three plus a two by three, that's okay. 
and then B that has two rows just like this over here. So that matches. This has three columns, which matches the, with the three columns here. Yeah, everything works out. Because all of the sizes line up the way that they need to, the block matrix multiplication does work. Okay, so to actually compute this thing, to actually compute this product here, well, I know what I3 is, I know what I3 is, I know what B is, I just need to compute this AB plus B. So I start off, I compute AB first as the side calculation. You do that just via regular matrix multiplication. And then you just add B to it. Again, that's just entry wise, okay? So just scroll back up, remind yourself of what B is, and you can do this calculation on your own, okay? It's just use the definitions of things. All works out with no hiccups. And then you just throw all these matrices in there. I3 in the bottom left, I3 in the bottom right, B in the top right, and then this matrix AB plus B in the top left, and that gives you your answer, okay? So because there are no size issues that prevent us from doing a calculation anywhere, it's all okay. You can do that block matrix multiplication. All right, so block matrix multiplication, it's really useful for actually simplifying calculations like we just saw, but it's also extremely useful as a theoretical tool. It's gonna to help us prove theorems over and over and over again in this course, starting with these two theorems that give us new ways of thinking about matrix multiplication itself. Okay, so we already saw one way of thinking about matrix multiplication. By definition, matrix multiplication is, well, you take rows of the first matrix and dot product them with columns of the second matrix. Okay, but here's another way of thinking about it, okay? Let's, or at least maybe not matrix multiplication in general, but matrix times column vector, okay? That's gonna be a very special case that we're gonna come back to over and over again. We're gonna dwell on this for the entirety of the next week. If you have a matrix and you multiply it by some column vector, right? So this is like an M by N times N by one. That's the thing you can do. What you're gonna get is you're gonna get a column vector as your answer. You're gonna get an M by one answer. And what it is, well, it turns out it's a linear combination of the columns of A. That's what this theorem is saying here, right? A1, A2 up to AN, those are the columns of A itself. And then V1, V2 up to VN, those are just the entries of V. So what this is saying is if you ever do a matrix times a column, what you get is a linear combination of the columns of A. And the coefficients of those, that linear combination are just the entries of the vector that you multiply by. So at first glance, this seems very weird. This is very, very different from our usual definition of matrix multiplication, right? But it's equivalent. And the way to see that is, well, you can just do block matrix multiplication. Just partition A and V as block matrices in a certain clever way, and this pops out, all right? So how do we do it? What we're gonna do is we're gonna write A and V as block matrices. And in particular, the way I'm gonna do it is I'm gonna write A in terms of its columns because that's sort of what's hinted at by the statement of the theorem here. I'm gonna write A as a block matrix, as a one by N block matrix, where the first block is its first column, the second block is its second column, and so on, down to A N is its last block, its last block is its last column. Okay, and then to be able to do this multiplication, I've gotta partition V so that you know, I can multiply by V over on the right here. And in other words, I'm gonna partition it so that it has N rows, okay? So the way to do that is just partition it you know, in terms of its entries. Each block is just one of its entries. Its first block is V1, its next block is V2, and so on. And now I've got a one by N block matrix. I'm gonna multiply that by an N by one block matrix, and I'll get a one by one block matrix when I do that. All right, well, if I do this block matrix times this block matrix, remember the way block matrix multiplication works is the same as regular matrix multiplication. It'll be this times this, plus this times this, all the way up to AN times VN, okay? So that's all I've written down here. That's my just usual rule for block matrix multiplication when I've partitioned it this way. And then I just look at all of these and I say, oh, well, V1's a scalar, I can pull that out in front. V2's a scalar, I can pull that out in front. VN's a scalar, I can pull that out in front. And then I'm done, that's exactly what I set up here, right? I got V1, A1, V2, A2, and so on down the line, okay? So yeah, it's this linear combination of the columns of A. And it just comes almost immediately for free if you believe in block matrix multiplication. All right, so that gives us a way of thinking about a matrix times a column vector, okay? And then once you're com comfortable with matrix times a column vector, you can sort of ramp up to matrix times matrix, okay? And here's how it works. Suppose now you've got any two matrices, A and B, okay? And they're, again, their inner dimensions match just so you can do the multiplication. Then what this theorem says is that each of the columns of the product, AB, can be written as A times some column vector. 
Okay, so a times b, that's the same thing as if you just do a times the first column of b and stick that in the first column. And then a times the second column of b and stick that in the second column and so on. In other words, you can do matrix multiplication sort of column-wise, one column at a time. All right, and again, the proof of this comes almost immediately for free from block matrix multiplication, okay? It's just a special case of block matrix multiplication. It's kind of an, even, an, even a weirder special case than the previous theorem though, okay? The way that we're gonna prove this one is we're gonna think of the matrix A as a one by, one by one block matrix where its only entry is A itself, okay? And that's a fine thing to do. It's sort of like the most trivial special case of block matrices. It's a fine thing to do though, okay? So A is just a one by one block matrix where it is its own entry. And then I'm gonna multiply that by B. So I've got to partition B in such a way that it has one row. Okay, so well, if I do it just according to its columns, which is hinted at by the theorem, right? I'm thinking of B as, you know, was the first column B, was the second column B and so on already. So let's just partition B in that way. All right, then this is a one by P block matrix. And because these inner dimensions one and one match up, I can do my matrix multiplication. And if I use my usual matrix multiplication rule, what happens is A times B, well, it just equals, you know, you do A times, and then you sort of do dot product with the first column over here. So A times B1, and then A times B2, and A all the way up to A times B, BP, okay? So that's just your usual matrix multiplication rule applied in the very weird case where you've got a one by one times a one by P, and this is all you get, okay? And that's exactly what the theorem said, okay? So this is just a ridiculously special case of block matrix multiplication. But the nice thing is, I mean, this gives us another way of thinking about matrix multiplication. A times B, so a product of two matrices, well, it's just column wise. And then how do you think about each of those columns? Well, each of those columns is a linear combination. Okay, so it just gives us different ways of looking at things and a way of combining all of these different ideas together, right? I mean, we already knew matrix multiplication, it's a whole bunch of dot products. But now we also know that it's a whole bunch of linear combinations. And it's gonna, like all of these sort of multiple connections in the same topics, that's what makes linear algebra so powerful. Having multiple different ways of thinking about the same thing is really a really, really powerful mathematical tool. All right, that's enough for today. This week was kind of a long one. But next week, we're gonna sort of look at the geometric side of matrices. What is matrix multiplication doing if we think about it geometrically? All right, so that's what I will see you for uh, next class. So I'll see you then.